the Reverend James Lawson is no stranger to Nashville, certainly not after this academic year that is now drawing to a close. Reverend Lawson's roots in Tennessee actually go much deeper than may be the case for many of us here. He first moved to this state in 1958. Here it was in Nashville that he met the woman who was going to be his wife, Dorothy, and we're sorry that she's not present today. Um, uh, they have family uh, near Chattanooga, in Franklin, in Memphis, and in some respects, I think, or I hope, uh, Tennessee functions still uh, somewhat as their second home. He entered Vanderbilt Divinity School as a student in 1958 and was famously expelled uh, from Vanderbilt University in 1960 after training demonstrators in nonviolence and then being arrested at the First Baptist Church Capitol Hill on March 4, 1960. These were events that drew worldwide attention to Nashville and were pivotal in bringing uh, the issue of segregation to the forefront of public debate. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. referred to him as, quote, the leading nonviolence theorist of the world, a well-deserved recognition earned during three years in India as a missionary and a student of the Gandhian movement. While in our minds we may associate Reverend Lawson most immediately with the events of 1960, he actually has had a long and distinguished career both in the civil rights movement and in the church. He served for 25 years as pastor of Holman United Methodist Church in Los Angeles, becoming pastor emeritus in 1999. Three times he has been recognized as distinguished alumnus at Vanderbilt by the Divinity School in 1996, by the Association of Vanderbilt Black Alumni in 2002, and by Vanderbilt University in 2005. Now, what much, what, uh, much of what I have said to this point will be well known to many uh, here among us. I'd like now to comment uh, on what has transpired during this current academic year at Vanderbilt. Thanks to the efforts of Chancellor Gordon Gee, Provost Nicholas Zepos, Associate Provost uh, Lucius Outlaw, and Divinity Dean J uh, James Hudnut Boimler, Reverend Lawson has spent this year as Professor Lawson, more specifically as Distinguished University Professor Lawson. Last month, we celebrated the establishment of the James Morris Lawson Jr. Chair. Uh, the first holder of this chair is Professor Dennis Dickerson in the History Department. And Dennis, I'd like you to stand, if you would, um, and be recognized. Thank you. <laughs> It was also announced that Vanderbilt has commissioned uh, an official portrait of Reverend Lawson by Simi Knox, the African-American painter who was the first black artist commissioned to, uh, to paint the official portrait of a sitting U.S. president, Bill Clinton. Reverend Lawson has also been a fellow in the Center for the Study of Religion and Culture, and it has been our pleasure to have his office in our suite and to see him on a regular basis. What you may not know but can imagine is how much he has been in demand uh, during his period here in Nashville. We've been helping uh, with his scheduling, which has been no minor task. He receives as many as 10 speaking engagement uh, invitations a day. While other visiting professors might spend their time sitting on their laurels, Reverend Lawson has made the effort to accommodate as many invitations as possible from two to six speaking engagements every week since he arrived. At universities in Nashville, at many churches, and conferences, special occasions. And the invitations keep coming. In addition, he has been on television and radio, including National Public Radio. There was a half-page article and interview in the New York Times this year, as well as numerous articles in the Tennessee and other uh, newspapers about him. Students have flocked to his two courses, even despite the reputation he acquired early for giving heavy reading assignments every week. La last fall, there, we have some of the students here, apparently. Uh, last fall, he taught a course called The Nonviolent Struggle, and this spring, his course is titled Jesus Against Christianity. 
A high point of the year, perhaps, was his participation in a remarkable event, Freedom Ride 2007, a two-day rolling seminar to Montgomery and Birmingham, Alabama, with four buses filled with about 200 students and faculty members, and accompanied by Reverend Lawson, along with seven others associated with the original Freedom Riders of 1961. Uh, all of this is to say that people of all ages have seen in Reverend Lawson a moral and spiritual leader of our times, as well as a key figure in the momentous and historic events of the Civil Rights Movement. We've sought his wisdom on issues of peace, nonviolence, civil rights, poverty, education, religion, morality. Halfway through the year, he told me that he was frankly surprised by the response he has had here in Nashville and beyond. We may not find it so remarkable, for we can sense the need for insight and guidance in troubled times. Fittingly, the Reverend Professor Lawson uh, will give a lecture this evening on the topic, Moving Ourselves from Unknown Peril to Noble Vision. I tried doing that introduction by Doug not to inhale. A mentor of mine 30 or 40 years ago said that when you're being introduced and all and there's much there that you might want to agree with but can't, you simply don't inhale and it uh, will pass over you. But I appreciate very much all the kind words that Dr. Knight has given me, and uh, appreciate especially this opportunity to be here for this uh, moment together and for the time that, uh, of this center for the study of culture and religion. Uh, I'm really very excited by what I've heard about the center and my year here with it, because um, in our lifetimes, we've seen so much specialization of things that to find a center where 80 faculty people of a university like Vanderbilt are lending their talent, their insight, their wisdom, their immense knowledge to working on the critical issues of culture and religion, that for me is one of the extraordinary projects going on in a university anywhere. I live in Los Angeles for, I've lived for 32 years in Los Angeles, uh, five to seven minutes away from the University of Southern California. And um, I've been in and out of that campus for various reasons over the years. Uh, nothing like this have I heard of. Um, uh, uh, faculty people recognizing the contribution they can make for us to uh, understand ourselves better, our society. I have always grieved over the fact that in this country of my birth, uh, where for me religion has been so important and overwhelming even, that our culture has reflected so little community and so much chaos, to use words from the past. So to see this center and to see this enormous effort going on um, is for me one of the signs of hope for the 21st century. I have relished my um, two semesters thus far at Vanderbilt. When I came in 1958, moved to Nashville in 1958, then enrolled at Vanderbilt in September of that year, Vanderbilt was still very much, I think, a parochial university. 
though there were very good things going on from my point of view, the, the development, the attracting and recruiting of a faculty to help move the university into a, a different level of life. And uh, as I looked around the South for where I was going to move in order to engage in the struggle for equality and justice uh, here, uh, I discovered that the Vanderbilt Divinity School was probably equal to any around the country at that time in 1958. Well, when I was expelled, many of them scattered Chicago, the University of Chicago, Harvard, uh, elsewhere, so you know the quality of people who were here. Um, but fundamentally, um, uh, Vanderbilt had not yet uh, grabbed hold of a vision of a national university and a university of a world-class level. And coming back now in, 50, in, in 2006, it's very clear to me that um, the diversity of the university, the ver diversity of thought and people represents uh, essentially a new day uh, and a new university. And I personally hope and pray that that push will continue in years to come. This is not to say that there are no longer any problems. Every generation has its issues to resolve, so there's no chance for that ever. But it is to say that change has occurred and is occurring. And the university inviting me to come as a visiting professor for this academic year is a sign of that change. It has been, in some ways for me, a provocative year, a year which I'm deeply challenged at, uh, at the point of who am I, what, am I been, what have I been about, and in the years I have remaining, what are the ways in which I can best work and, and live and, and be. So, um, I just simply want to share that with you um, as opening remarks. Uh, as uh, Doug Knight has already said, uh, I have deep connections with Tennessee in so many different ways. And, and Nashville is one of the places that uh, I feel myself to be in a home place, a place where I belong where there's not simply family, but there are all sorts of people uh, with whom I am more than pleased to be uh, uh, bound in life and work and uh, in future possibilities. I am going to try to restrict my remarks to between 30 and 40 minutes, if you're lucky. Uh, and then um, we can open up for some questions and comments. Moving ourselves from an unknown peril to noble vision. Now, many people are not aware that our society, our nation as a whole, our economy, Christianity, the university, the churches and temples are in peril. John Hope Franklin, a year and a half or so ago, was celebrating at Duke University in Durham his 90th birthday. For those who do not know, he is one of the extraordinary historians of this country. Um, Professor Emeritus of History now at Duke University. In celebrating that 90th birthday, he made remarks, and one of the remarks was this, that as a historian, now, of course, of, of more than 60 years, across this nation, he and many of his peers, he said, feel that at no time in our 400-year history has our nation been in greater danger, in greater peril. 
and this present time. And then, if our, of course, also uh, he added uh, then the present president, and I would add the present Congress, and the Congresses of the last several years as well. The war in Iraq could be a kind of a metaphor for that peril. It is a consequence of the determination of the United States since at least 1960, since at least 1939, uh, to be not only a superpower, but to have the military forces to protect our interests, meaning our businesses, anywhere in the world. The Iraq War proceeded more out of that movement of nearly 60 years than from any <laughs> danger from the Middle East or danger from Iraq itself. In other words, I'm saying that it was more a part of our being a military security state, more a part of the role of covert government over the last 50 years especially, more a part of the rise of what's being called the conservative Bush since at least 1980, more a consequence of that drive than from any altruism. And there were many people around the world who saw this and knew this. I knew it. If now it's a disorder that we cannot understand, it is not because there were not persons in the United States who knew better, but because the drive of those forces that think this nation must become something different other than a people who are trying to experiment in self-governance and the like had too much power and too much control and have used it without wisdom and almost without purpose other than their own purpose. We are a nation in peril and that this could happen with 300 million people wanting uh, life to be somewhat different than that. 300 million people who still claim, according to the sociological studies, that the way the tax dollar should be spent is in relationship to education and jobs and housing and health care and transportation, not war. One has to ask the question, how is it that we can continue to be in this adventure towards escalation of violence rather than engaged in looking at ourselves and our own, and our own concerns? We are in peril, and I want to insist, secondly, that we cannot understand the peril, nor can we move ourselves away from it with any neat panaceas. The elections uh, cannot do it. Neither political party has a vision that is sufficient to see the dangers and the complexities of the times in which we live and to try to apply to them the larger values from our uh, history and the like. Uh, no candidate who's running for the presidency in year 2008 should be seen as a savior. It did not take us four years to get into this plight. It took 400 years. It's taken at least the last 37 years for the likes of Jerry Farwell to be a shaper of the president's mind in the United States. It's not going to be unraveled or resisted or halted or the beginning of a reverse in any easy form. My theme this evening is very simple, that only we, the people,
can become the vehicle and the channel for changing the peril. Only we, <clears throat> as a community of hope and faith, as a community of compassion, only the 300 million people getting their horizons changed and lifted can become the force and I use that term in its sense of an energy and power can become the force to move away from peril to move towards noble vision and understanding. A major cause of the peril is because we in the United States have been more largely shaped by the hidden history which we deny than we have been shaped by uh, the mythologies that we uh, credit to ourselves. This is not to say that we are exceptional from other peoples in the world. This is not to say that we are the worst peoples in the world. But it is to say that we have had a particular history as a people unlike the history of any other peoples. All peoples have had their ups and downs. All peoples have had their share of wrongdoing. All peoples have had violence in their past. But I insist that our particular history has been a peculiar one for us the decimation of Native Americans, which has taught us that violence is the way to solve problems, the way to get what you want nationally. But violence also teaches a spiritual thing that we've ignored. That's this. Violence teaches us that human life is not really precious and sacred in the sight of creation. That there are some human beings who are better dead than they are alive. And we have had such slogans in our history often used to justify our violence. We established a slavery. And no doubt there were values in that 250 years of slavery as a national economic institution. No doubt wealth was accumulated. No doubt money, capital was poured into the Industrial Revolution at a faster pace perhaps than we would have been able to achieve otherwise. No doubt the American bread pass basket became a reality in the 19th century as a consequence of that indentured servanthood. No doubt some families did achieve wealth and power, but there's an underside that's been forgotten. That underside plays itself out now in our economy, even around Nashville, Tennessee, because it helped us to develop a form of capitalism which says something like this. The worker doesn't really matter. There are some people who are meant only for work and hard work. They do not need to be paid in a sufficient fashion so that they can achieve sustenance for themselves and for their families, that they can set goals for their own future. And so right today we have factories and jobs of all sorts around Nashville and Los Angeles where working people doing essential work for the well-being of the society receive little or nothing and remain in poverty. Slavery taught us also that structural poverty is a good thing. And though some conservative voices are pretending 
that the poor are poor because it's their choice, or the unemployed are unemployed because they don't care, that is, of course, the lie with which across the centuries we have therefore used that we have denied the issues that shape us in hidden ways. Through those years also, the underbelly of our history has been the fact that women were not to be equal, though certainly the town hall meetings of the early 18th century proclaimed the equality of all human life and all human beings. But that was quickly forgotten in the turmoil of the political decisions that had to made, be made to get our country going. But again, the interior consequence of that is that millions of people, and oftentimes women themselves, think that they really shouldn't have equal access to education and to work and to play and to life. They really should not share in the shaping of society and the politics and the economy and the rest of it. The underside is the vicious attack in the name of pro-life, in the name of being anti-abortion, to insist that women are to have a subservient role in the life of the nation and of the family and the family and the world. In utter contradiction to our finest notions, whether we take those notions from the Declaration of Independence or from the first chapter of the book of Genesis of the Hebrew Bible. The point I'm making is that the peril is spiritual and moral. It is political from the perspective of ancient wisdom where the politic is what is required to build community and understanding, to lay the framework for justice, to build what we in the, 20, in the 60s used to call the beloved community, a community that's trying to solve its problems, that doesn't deny the past, but learns from the past in order to better shape character for creating a future that is full of promise and possibilities. How do we move ourselves from unknown peril? And I use the word unknown deliberately. Because most of us today in the United States are unaware of the depth of the issues that face our world or our nation. We are not aware of how deeply into the fabric of politics the military security state goes. Almost every week, if not every day, you see hints in various places in the internet or the press, the newspapers, or news magazines of the turmoil and the quagmire in Washington, D.C., in government, and um, the way in which the military decision comes first. We no longer have a foreign service or a State Department. It is an auxiliary unit of the Pentagon and military intelligence. The police departments of our nation are unified now by internet with the FBI and military intelligence and the CIA. Most of us are unaware 
that these things are going on. I say we no longer actually have a democracy. We have a society in which the essential decisions are being made by the few and by huge corporate entities that by Congress and by the White House. And we have a corporate media that does not know how to print the story of the American people, where we are, who we are, what the issues are, how we live in various parts of the country. We have a media that encourages us to be separate from one another rather than to find ourselves as 300 million people. This is, from my perspective, the peril we face. And the task of changing that, I say, is not the task of Washington, D.C., or the governors, or the state legislators. I maintain it's our task. It is our work. Now, I take that in part from our history. Because the major advances in the affections of the people of this land have not come from official sources. The major lifting of the consciousness of the people across our 400 years invariably has come from us. I could give many illustrations, but let me just suggest two. There was an endless debate going on in the United States in Congress and among the presidents and the political parties concerning slavery. It was almost always being debated from the point of view of the efficacy of the political decisions. The slave states were firm in their exaggeration that slavery was a part of the fabric of the nation and had to be preserved at all costs. They were also firm in the notion that states' rights must prevail over, must prevail over um, a nation coming together as a people. A tiny band of people around 1830 formed the Anti-Slavery Society and began to agitate against slavery. There were not very many people in that society. There were a fair number of people who called themselves non-resisters. It included people like Frederick Douglass, William Garrison. They met fierce hostility as they began small meetings and then larger meetings as they welcomed escaped slaves and some of those slaves became voices in the movement. They refused to be quiet. They protested what they thought to be a monumental evil in the land, a cancer that would destroy the land unless it was faced. And the point I'm wanting to make is simply this that they changed the consciousness of the nation. They started their own papers. They wrote books. They published the biographies of escaped slaves. They walked in the territory of hostile congregations and spoke. They buttonholed the clergy. Every time there was an opportunity arose where an escaped slave was being, uh, his face was being plastered in, let's say, a Boston. They organized their own units 
that would see to it that neither the federal government nor bounty hunters from South Carolina could find the slave and take him back into servitude. They were an extremely unpopular group of people. But they forged a perspective in this country that put the anti-democratic features of slavery and the dehumanization of slavery as an agenda which would not allow the nation to escape. And many of them did this from a perspective of what they called non-resistance, Christian non-resistance. One illustration, second illustration I will give, comes from Nashville itself, where in 1958, as John Siegenthaler has said so very well, Nashville was similar to the apartheid of South Africa. Two peoples largely separated, though there were those who said that race relations were moderate and peaceful but this university itself at that time was a paragon of segregation not diversity I raise this issue as often, often as I can because It was a moral issue of the 20th century that all across the United States, by custom and law, and the attitudes that were being in taught people, you had signs that read, white colored over restrooms and drinking fountains in Nashville. But in New York, you had signs that said, no Jew. In my part of the country, California, you had signs outside of Glendale, California, and San Clemente that said no Jew, no Negro allowed in this community. In South Dakota, you had signs which said no Indian allowed in this theater or this skating rink or this restaurant or this store. Now, I don't want to draw this out, but I want to try to say to you that those signs were a disgrace to religion and democracy in the United States, and there were no protests. I do not recall as a college student in Ohio, 47 to 51, any protests that those signs were teaching this nation the exact opposite of what we as a people said we were and wanted to be. There was no protest out of the white community or the white churches. And none to my knowledge out of the black churches. Had Kelly Miller Smith and Andrew White and C.T. Vivian and Alice Smith, and Mrs. C.M. Hayes, and Georgia Taylor, and Dolores Wilkerson, and Jim Lawson, asked for a discussion about those signs, we would have never moved as we did. But we ourselves decided that it was time that those visible symbols of separation and dehumanization be challenged. And we reached that decision in the spring of 1959 and we proceeded around nonviolent struggle to put the movement together 
that's now called the sit-in campaign in Nashville, but it was a movement to desegregate downtown Nashville. It's called the movement for a hamburger, which was not the case at all. It was the movement to go at the gut of the system, pull the signs down, change this public display of a tyranny that we were calling normalcy. I use those two illustrations to suggest to you that we can become the folk that move ourselves away from the peril of the present moment towards noble vision. The wisdom of the ages proclaims that where there is no vision, a people perish. And vision in that 29th chapter of Proverbs, the 18th verse, is not about dreaming, nor is it about predicting the future. Vision there means justice and truth. The human spirit having options for the future that can fulfill creation's promise. War is never a vision, nor is sexism, nor is racism, nor is materialism and greed. These are not visions. These are lusts for power and for self-centeredness that always lead us astray. A vision is about every boy and ca girl counts no matter who they are or what they are, no matter the circumstances of their birth. A vision is about the notion that a nation that would value itself will give the most serious attention to having a priority of its children as the priority of its budget, of its energy, of its research, of its conversation of its work. A vision is about truth. It is hard for us in the United States to have public discussions that face some of the issues that, I've, that I have listed. We cannot have decent conversations on racism, sexism. We talk around them, we walk past each other. I've found this as a pastor over the years in the office as a pastor. People coming with all sorts of issues, painful, undermining the family, undermining themselves. It taking a certain kind of raw courage to be willing to unwrap the issues, to try to see them from various angles and exposing them, bringing all the various parties into the conversation, bringing to bear the spiritual life, the power indeed of the spirit bringing to bear the meaning of forgiveness and reconciliation and healing. It, takes raw, it, it would take all the time in most situations a kind of ordinary human courage to face the pain of facing what the issue is about. But I discovered over and over again that if there's a way through for wholeness or healing or health or maturity to bring calm to the crisis and to use the crisis for undergirding life and undergirding the family, there had to be that willingness to face the matter forthrightly lovingly, even with anger. 
and to walk through it. We can move ourselves from unknown peril to a noble vision. And the instrument for our moving is the stuff that is in each one of us. The stuff that I have come to call nonviolence, or the image of God, or the likeness of God. The stuff of the universe that is compassion and love. The substance of life, which is indeed the fact that human life itself is an end in itself. It is that which Gandhi took and proceeded to find the steps towards that becoming the theory for tackling the problem in the politics and beginning to get the problem to be reversed. It is not a theory for cowardliness or cowards. It is a theory of courage. To be yourself, to be who you've been called to be, to be the one who God has made you to be, is the raw courage out of which peril can be transformed into picking up again our experiment in democracy in the United States. The pages of history are now full of the examples of millions and millions of people in every century, in every decade of the 20th century, in almost every decade in the United States in the 20th century. people who, sensing the call of the Creator for life, withdrew their consent to a status quo going wrong, and trusted the gift of life in themselves to reach out and touch other hands and arms, and out of the small group develop the larger group in the larger group. Today, only a new sense of awareness of our lives will help us to change where the Iraq War and other examples would take us. The bottom line is this, that we human beings can take better care for the gift of our life, can take better care of ourselves. The bottom line is that we can have a better Nashville, a better United States, a better world. But the way through is not through the realm of violence or revenge or hate, the way through is believing what we say, that we have been endowed with certain inalienable rights. And that precious gift of life also shows us how we can move from impending unknown peril towards a noble vision that can save the day. The prophet Isaiah said it very, very well. The knaves, in other translation, it reads, the fools develop knaveries that are evil. They lie to the poor, even though the needs of the poor are real. The noble one uses noble ways to create noble goals.
we can have a better world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Lawson. Uh, we will open the floor for some questions. Uh, after the question and answer period, uh, I remind you we will have a reception as well. But let's take some uh, time now where you can uh, pose some questions or comments to uh, Reverend Lawson. Please. Yes, back here. And if I could ask you to try to speak out as, as well as possible so that others, uh, everyone can hear. Please. Where is that passage in Isaiah? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't uh, peg it. Uh, it's chapter 32, verses 7 and 8. Uh, the King James Version is even more startling. <laughs> Go ahead, just stand and speak up. Oh, okay. It seems so hard to uh, lead people. You certainly were successful in uh, the civil rights movement here in Nashville. Christ, uh, you know, had 12 apostles. One sold them. Can you hear me okay? Uh huh. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, Christ had 12 apostles. He trained them for three years. One sold them, and the other 11 took off. Uh, whenever you have a movement, it seems like. Uh, People, well, John Adams said one-third were f for the revolution. Yes. One-third were against it. Yeah. One-third didn't give a darn. Yeah. You know, how do you have the hope and the wisdom to take on the cause that you're suggesting here? Yes, no, no doubt. Um, in, in every movement in the United States, no doubt, perhaps 10, 15 percent, were the people who were the activists and the energized and the folk who were the theorists and who took the risk and the rest of it. Uh, some of these people we know, most people in our society we do not know um, uh, at all. But it should be said in every case a different consciousness began to emerge in East Germany in the 80s, um, the resistors standing in um, Leipzig around the St. Nicholas Square with their candles in the prayer vigil Monday night, night after night. Everyone in Leipzig did not come. 300,000 eventually wound up there in October. But the mood of the nation had changed. Those demonstrations in every city broke the authority of the communist authoritarian government so that they could no longer govern. They lost control of the military because the military was called out on October 23rd, 1989, as I recall, and the military said, we will not fire on our own people. But the, the resistance movement, however, had been going for quite some time. The consciousness of the people of East Germany, Germany was that we do not need to fear this government. They can do us no more harm than what they've already done us done and we will resist and we will take our destiny in our own hands. Yes, probably only 10 percent, uh, but it effected the change. In the case of the United States, I'll give uh, illustrations of this in the United States. In the case of the United States, the most important thing about the movement of which I was a part in the 50s and 60s was not the Voting Rights Bill of 1965. 
I disagree with the academics who see that in 64 civil rights bill. I maintain that the most important thing was the consciousness that was aroused all around the country where literally millions of people, King called this the coalition of conscience, millions of people from all walks of life, the university, the church, the synagogue, political people of various kinds, um, said to the country, to the government, we can make changes, let's make the changes. Perhaps the most important vehicle of that movement was Medicare, in 1965. Head Start, I think, also was 65. Those measures that affected the whole nation passed overwhelmingly because of the people that bombarded Congress with the notion, we can change our time and we can make the future different. So that's simply another illustration. I mean, this is what's being fought today. I mean, the so-called conservatism movement, which I think is more racist than is conservative. It's more committed to control by big corporations than anything else. Um, they are fighting the gains in the 60s, especially the notion that the business of government is the well-being of the people. They have fundamentally changed it to the business of the government is the wealthy and the corporation. And, and remember now, this is, this, in, in some ways, this is really new in our history because uh, while an Andrew Jackson had certain populist notions of the quality of life, he had to fight vigorously against the folk who said the government cares for property and wealth and power, not the quality of life of the masses. So um, the 20th century is where that battle has been fought more than anywhere else. So I simply say it happens. It can be done. Nineteen ninety-six, you came back to Vanderbilt. I've got two questions about that. One, how did it feel? And the other is, I know because I had a student who worked for Chancellor Branscombe that he invited you to his home at that time. Yes. And I'd love to know what you all talked about. Well, we talked we talk about one another. We talked to each other about ourselves, our, where we've been, what's been going on. And uh, Chancellor Branscombe made it clear that nothing should have ever happened to me <laughs> in 1960. But I knew that anyway. <laughs> but uh, he made that clear. He apologized to me. He apologized to my wife later that day. Uh, he was 101, that's correct. Yeah, we spent, it was supposed to be for an hour long, and we spent nearly three hours together in one of his sitting rooms uh, and, and, and visited. But you, you have to know, um, um, I tend not to call myself a Christian. I call myself a follower of Jesus uh, and uh, a one striving in that direction. And um, uh, as far as I understand the, the ideas of Jesus, one of them is the fact, the fact of forgiveness uh, before it's asked. And uh, neither Dorothy and I, or I in 1960 had any animosity towards Branscombe or towards James Stallman or towards John Sloan, who were the precipitating the, the catalytic uh, trustees in, on the executive committee at that time. Um, um, in um, the spiritual journey there can be a cost for taking risk and um, uh, we saw my expulsion is not something we expected but something that could have you know we didn't anticipate it we didn't plan on it we didn't want it but when it came we were prepared to live through it and go on with our lives but one of the wonderful things now is the fact that the university is owning me as an alumnus <laughs> and owning the, that episode as an episode in the history of the university that's helped to move the university towards 
um, values of the university that are significant and of great importance. And so to, to have lived long enough that I can be here today is for me uh, an exhilarating experience. I'm not even sure how to handle all of this. Um, it, it's, it has been completely unexpected, but um, one that I hope that I am giving some uh, attention and value to. Yes. Uh, Dr. Lawson, I thank you for coming, and uh, I, I agree with much of what you say, and uh, some of it I, I don't agree with. Um, but but especially the, your points about the military and about the media, I felt like those are two two points that are especially poignant at this time. Um, uh, the depth to which the mil military and military consciousness is inbred in our culture is something that deeply concerns me and the role that the media plays in misinforming the general public. Um, I would just like you to comment on maybe two points. Uh, one is, I think that in, in this country, one of the, the greatest challenges that we face is that we have so much more than most of the rest of the world. And we have almost no strategy for how to reconcile the difference between our wealth and our abundance and most of the world's poverty and lack of resources. And we have a tremendous moral responsibility, which I think we completely fail to address. And I think that this sickens our country and it, it, it disempowers the rest of the world. The, the fact that we don't know how to share our resources and how to raise the standard globally. And the other point I'd like you to possibly comment on is that in this country, it seems like ordinary people don't understand what they're capable of. We, we don't know, we still don't know how to organize amongst ourselves. It seems like we don't know what we're capable of as human beings what we could do in our community, mm -hmm. with our government, and uh, with our country. Thank you. It should be said that part of the wealth of the last 30 years in particular has been the wealth that, that we have acquired from Africa, Latin America, Asia, through the World Bank the International Monetary Fund and some of the regional agencies that we have created as a part of our policy, which are official governmental agencies that we control and that have pushed a neoliberal, that's being called neoliberal economics, so that a Tanzania is not encouraged to continue to try to feed its own people, but to raise the crops that we in the West can use and they can export to us. And why we are so hostile to Castro and to uh, Hugo Chavez is that they are both engaged in a form of developing their countries not dependent upon the transfer of goods from those countries to the United States. The debts that these countries owe have already been paid back literally tens and hundreds of times, mostly to the banks of the United States, but also Berlin and London and Paris. We don't know that for 500 years the wealth of these other continents have flowed to the West and in the last century especially to the United States. Uh, and, 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 and the simple thing that Hugo Chavez has said is this. We have these large reserves of oil and the world needs the oil. 
until now, the profits from the oil went to the Western oil companies. But now, the major profit, the Western oil companies can still get a profit, but it is not 80% of what's been going on as it has been in the past. Now, that 80% is being turned back into social, political, economic policies for Venezuela. A sizable program that I've not seen written up in the major press at all, talking of the drive against illiteracy and hunger and homelessness and trying to raise the folk in abject poverty up. Uh, we don't even read these stories. Uh, I grew up in Ohio with a, a very fine school system and in my sophomore year in high school, I started taking drama and speech and debate and other stuff like that. And as a consequence, as homework had to go to the library, the public library, and read all the newspapers and all the magazines, and as many books on many different issues, a habit which I've kept up since. The press in that time was more available for reporting who, what, when. Some were still bad, were bad, Time Magazine as an example, but News Mag Newsweek was fairly good in my high school years and in my college years, in my early adult years. It was fairly good. New York Times uh, was much more reliable for a, an article, sometimes large, small, that would outline many of the different dimensions of the issue that you could do, go then and do research. Newsweek used to do the same thing. Uh, I'll never forget, atomic bombs were dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, August the 6th and the 9th, 1945, the end of the war. And that year, as I began my senior year, the National Forensic Society of the Nation changed the debate topic to nuclear Energy, something like nuclear energy um, uh, means the abolishment of mass armies. So those of us who were debaters had to dig in. There was no, nothing available. <laughs> Manhattan Project, all of that. We had to dig in to try to work on that topic for the year. Now, what I'm saying to you, that we found materials I don't think you can do that very well today with just the newspapers and the magazines. American people know nothing about what poverty is in the United States. We do not know the dimensions of homelessness. We are very patriotic, but we do not know the high percentage of veterans from the Korean, Vietnam, 1990 Gulf War, who are in the streets, who are mentally ill, who are in prison because we have not taken care of them. How has that happened? <laughs> Huge dimensions. Uh, we're at the stage today where we already have seven million people in the criminal justice system. Two and a half million of them are in prison. Two 2.2 million in prison. We already have more people in the criminal justice system than we had slaves in 1865. If we keep going in this direction, we will have more people in the prisons of our country in a few years than we had as slaves. And most of us are unaware of this tyranny that is a combination of economic life, racism, the war on drugs, <laughs> the war on crime, and we're all safer as a consequence. Thank you very much.